Thank you all for coming out tonight. Welcome to our event. Um, I have a few thank yous to make tonight. As always, I want to thank our support groups, the Friends of the Library and the Library Foundation for making events like this possible. Yeah. And tonight, I also want to thank the California Academy of Sciences for helping arrange this event. A uh, particular thank you to Katie and Haley. Um, I also want to thank our speaker tonight, Dr. Brian Fisher, who also works at Cal Academy, not just for presenting, but also for providing my dinner tonight. <laughs> you may have seen the sign over there for the cricket powder that says, do not eat. I was fortunate to get to eat some of that. Um, I was able to put on some yogurt. And if you want to listen to me eating it, we recorded an interview that's gonna be on our podcast series. It'll be posted next week. And the microphones are good enough that you should be able to hear me eat the crickets. So that'll be posted next week, hopefully. It's a new series, it's called Borrow Time. This is our kickoff event for the series, so welcome. Um, all year long, we're gonna be addressing climate change. This is part of that. Um, every month, we're gonna talk about a different topic. This month is mass extinction. Um, we wanted to start with what's at stake. December's hope, so we go a little brighter, start dark and bright, hopefully. Um, and I have to admit, it was a little awkward writing to California Academy and asking if they had any scientists willing to talk about mass extinction. Um, it was also awkward to write, do not eat crickets if you have allergies to shellfish. But I'm glad I wrote both of them. Um, and you probably received one of these patches. This is the freebie for tonight. All year long throughout um, the program, we're gonna be offering incentives to do little activities that address climate change related stuff. One of them is read it and weep. If you read our recommended readings throughout the year, you'll get the read it and weep patch. So you can sign up for that. Um, we're also doing other incentives throughout the year, so just keep an out an eye for that. On Monday, we're screening a documentary called Racing Extinction. So every month we're gonna screen a documentary, every month we're gonna have a recommended book reading, and every month we're gonna have a featured event such as this. But they're not all, I'll be upstairs. Um, and I could talk on and on about this. I have a lot to say. So we also started a blog series that's also on the Borrow Time website. You can check that out. But without further delay, I'm gonna pass things over to our presenter tonight, Dr. Brian Fisher. He's the curator of entomology at the California Academy of Sciences. He's known as the Ant-Man in part because he's written books like this, Field Guide to Ants in North America. And without further delay, oh, he also lives in Mill Valley. So I'm gonna pass things over to Brian. Thank you, Andrew. It really makes me proud to be at a, in a town that has a library, a public library, which you often think it's just a place to go read the Chronicle or find a magazine that's thinking forward, it's, a, it's alive, it's active. You know, scientists also have this problem. We think we're just about facts. You come to us for facts, anybody want a fact? I'll give you some, I have loads of them. But we don't actually say anything that may be relevant to issues around us. And our library, our Mill Valley Library, is taking a stance about the future. And you all came here, Either for wine, who came for wine? Yes, a lot of people, yes I know, but the others who aren't here for the wine also came for the future. Maybe the future of wine, will it change the taste, the climate change? But I'm actually very happy. I live in Mill Valley for 20 years and some of you I know from the parking lot at Whole Foods or uh, yoga, um, but it's great you all came to hear about uh, what we do at the California Academy of Sciences. And, um, also, a big cheer for the Cal Academy of Sciences, who um, is a great institution. Sandy Ross is the wife of Ed Ross, who was a curator for like 100 years at the, the California Academy of Sciences. Um, he actually was somebody that inspired me. I came to a talk by his in like 1982, and he showed me that the world is there for exploring, and that's really been what I've been doing my entire life. But actually, I'm going to tell you a little bit about that, but also about what I think is a solution for the people of Madagascar, for their landscapes. It combines their traditional practices with some innovative technology. It's something that scales from villages to urban areas. It's something that goes from Madagascar to Africa. 
It's a solution, I think, that gives hope um, in this changing climate. You know, we may have ignored it, we may have buffered ourselves, but I think maybe the power outage, the rising seas have really made it us think that maybe we too may be impacted. We can keep buying time by gating our communities, but in the world, they can't run, they can't just buy a generator, they have to either move or they have to find a solution. And I'm going to be talking about a solution, I think, that actually is probably the most sustainable solution for these people. Now, I want to begin my story with my love, my love for ants. Now, ants are like the lead player in this ecological theater. Shakespeare once wrote that though she be but little, she is fierce. They more than make up their, in their small size with their numbers. And that's really important. But not all, ins, all ants, just ants, but all insects really, I call, are the glue that holds forests together. Now, if you went to Muir Woods, you can't help but notice those large trees. But an ecosystem is more than just that growth. It's that brown cycle. It's the turning over of nutrients that make it actually alive. A brown cycle is run by the insects. They're the vacuum cleaners. They're the glue that holds that ecosystem together. And that's why we need insects. In fact, you could remove... Can you hear me? Now, if you go into a forest, these big trees aren't the whole story. Insects are the glue that holds it together, and they do it without us even noticing until maybe they're on our toilet seat or in our kitchen uninvited, especially the ants. Now, I call them the invisible majority. And I'm going to tell you why they're important. But my story begins even before I even cared about ants. I wanted to explore the tropics, to go far away, like Ed Ross, and visit the places that are unknown and to make discoveries. And I thought, I'm going to do that with plants. So as an undergraduate, I went down to Panama, and I luckily met two of the greatest botanists, and I traveled with them. And they were working for an NGO called Conservation International, and they were part of this rapid assessment program they would fly into an area and explore it, discover new plant species, and assess if that area should be a park. Sign me up. So I went with them, we explored mountains, discovered new plant species, but every plant I saw was covered with ants. And I said, what about these ants? And they said, nobody knows about these ants. There's no field guy, there's nothing. And pretty soon, I left those plants and started studying only ants. It's not that different just a P and an L, but it's a world where you have to be really focused on the little things that run the world. Now, ants are not what you expect. If you see an ant, you say, there's an ant, but that's not the ant. The ant is the superorganism. Why do ants carry food back to the nest? Anybody? Why do they carry food back to the nest? Because they're Nice. No, it's actually <laughs> the stomach of an ant colony is in the nest. They have to bring food back to feed themselves. They can't eat solid food. They're carrying the food back to put it in the stomach. The stomach is the larva. That larva eats the food and then they spit it up. And other ants come along, their sisters, and they suck it up and put it in their social stomach, then walk around and regurgitate it and feed the other sisters. They can drink liquid, but they can't eat. Try it at home. <laughs> it's a very effective way of sharing food within a community. They're magic. Their collective intelligence, though, is what makes them really interesting. They can sol solve problems. In fact, the accumulation of all this greatness about ants, to me, is in the army ants. They're like a wolverine pack that sweeps through the forest, eating everything in their way. And I thought, if I want to convince people ants are cool, I got to bring army ants to San Francisco. So I went to the Home Depot in Marin County, got my shop vac, and sucked up a half a million workers in Central America and brought them to the California Academy of Sciences. 
And we had them on display for one year where they migrated in nomadic form from nest to nest. But I had to feed them. So I called up a place and said, hey, I'm going to have a pet that eats a lot. I need 25,000 crickets every morning. And they said, no problem. I said, really? No problem? I need it every day. And they said, no problem. That's a small order. I said, really? Who's, what are you doing with all these crickets? But anyway, we fed them 25,000 crickets, and each ant took off a leg, and the kids loved them. Maybe you might have seen the exhibit at the California Academy of Sciences. Anybody? You remember it. You were there watching. He was young then. He, watching the ants take off legs and eating them. It was a fabulous exhibit. But I didn't really make the connection. I missed an opportunity here to realize the importance of rearing crickets. I was busy. In fact, I wasn't just making an exhibit about ants. I was busy in Madagascar. Anybody been to Madagascar? Anybody? Nobody. Well, maybe that's why you came, to learn about Madagascar. Madagascar is famous because of this movie about lemurs. Anybody see the movie? No, you guys, or your grandchildren saw the movie? <laughs> now, the place is probably on your bucket list to go visit because it's wonderful. And it's on every biologist's bucket list because of the incredible animals that are there. See, Madagascar broke away from Africa a long time ago, about 120 million years ago, along with India. Then India broke away about 80 million years ago, dropped the Seychelles, hit India, created the Himalayas. Meanwhile, Madagascar's sitting there all by itself, like in its own world. Everything evolved to be just in Madagascar. Lemurs, 130 species, primates only found in Madagascar and very different than Africa. If he had one foot in Kenya and jumped over to Madagascar, no ungulates, no pythons. Everything is different, no giraffes. But what few people realize, this paradise for tourists and biologists is not really a paradise. All that white is degraded landscapes, overgrazed grasslands that was once forest. 54% of the children are malnourished. 92% of the people are in poverty. It's one of the four countries that have increased their number of people or percentage of people in poverty over the last 20 years. The, only, the three other countries have civil war. Well, I've spent the last 25 years being the biologist there to discover. I'm just now beginning to deal with these other aspects of being in Madagascar. Now, in Madagascar, I've, I've traveled everywhere. In fact, to understand Madagascar, I had to travel all the other islands, and also Mozambique, and I wanted to actually document, like those early plant people I met in um, Panama, I wanted to discover and figure out where we should put national parks in Madagascar. To explore Madagascar sounds easy on paper. You can go, there's a forest, I'm going to go there. But in reality, it's something very different. We spend more time getting to a forest in Madagascar than we do actually in the forest. And this is a good day. You can actually see what you're doing. On bad days, it gets even worse. And on really bad days, we just float around <laughs> getting there. But Madagascar is so interesting. There's so little that we understand that Every trip we've gone on, we've discovered new species. In fact, while I've been there, I've discovered over a thousand new species of ants. Just ants. We've discovered thousands and thousands of other new species. But it's more, every place we've gone to is difficult to get to. It's like all of Africa shrunk down into a little island. Some places have been so beautiful, we've made documentaries and films about arriving there or canoeing in or kayaking in to get to these places. But the end game is to get to a place like this, a forest that's unknown, where you can be a biologist and make those discoveries. We've been to 450 forest sites across Madagascar using the same techniques to understand and compare sites across the island. We've used standardized techniques that we've helped invent while we were there. These are entomological tools. It's just fun. We collect leaf litter. It's like being a kid. 
and we collect all the insects in the leaf litter, we beat trees, we have this wonderful trap called a malaise trap where it captures flying insects. They don't see the black, they hit it, and they want to escape, they go up, but they actually go up into a bottle of alcohol. This malaise trap will come back in a moment, so hang on to malaise trap. But the fun is just being there in nature. It's like being in a cathedral where you feel it's different because it's very few people get to be there. And you have to be comfortable. This is Chris Sla. He's worked with me about 20 years collecting ants across Madagascar. And you get to make discoveries. Just a couple of incredible discoveries. Here's one of the Dracula ants that we've discovered, which is really bizarre. In fact, we first thought, oh, a red species and a black species. Well, it looks like different, right? But as it turns out, we finally found a colony of it. And this red one, which were half the individuals, were the queens. There's usually supposed to be one queen, and the queen is supposed to be larger. But this is a whole new form of ant reproduction hidden underground in Madagascar. Another ant on the left, the colony entrance was this like ear. And what is it doing? It's this ant that has this weird strategy of keeping other predators from coming in. In fact, this ant is there on the lip. And if another ant comes along, or another predator, it grabs it and then jumps off. Suicide. Saving the colony from any other predators. It's on this face clip. They always live on these big cliffs. And that's how it survives. This other ant is this jumping trap jaw ant. It's, we've measured it with high-speed cameras, and it's one of the fastest movements ever recorded. Overall, insects are easy to find, and there's lots of them. In fact, to do our study in Madagascar, we had to think about how we're going to manage all these insects. Like, I'm taking the ants, but what about all the other insects? So we started training a lot of people about how to sort and process material, really creating entomology as a profession in Madagascar. And working with partners in the Bay Area, we created our Biodiversity Center in Madagascar, where we specialize in entomology. This is actually funded by Bay Area uh, members. And there we train entomologists, we teach entomology, and we do research in entomology. And it's actually our, our focus. Now, over the last um, 25 years, we've discovered and documented a lot of diversity. But I began to get worried. I've gone back to places where the forest is gone. Forest is disappearing. And I kept saying, well, we're documenting biodiversity. As an entomologist, that's what I can do. But I began to wonder, you know, in 50 years, is there going to be any forest left? It's disappearing. And I felt I needed to rethink what I'm doing. As an entomologist, maybe there's something more I can do. Well, for one thing, I thought, we have to start using our tool to address problems in Madagascar. The first, I thought, we have to change how we do inventories. In a sense, I wonder if we could create, like, a Dow Jones Index environment and somehow know in real time what's happening. You know, help us make decisions. What happens if we put a mine there, or a road there, or a school there? And how do we do that? I've been struggling about inventories, lots of specimens, training people, shipping specimens everywhere. How do we actually get that data in real time to actually think about how we can actually manage that? Well, thanks to kind of modern technology, combining new what's called genomics, with it's just DNA at large scale, and using neural networks to help us identify stuff, we actually can create almost a live digital readout of the environment, at least certain groups of the environment. So we were lucky to get funding to launch one of the largest monitoring projects in the world in Madagascar. It began with funding from Sweden, of all places, and somehow we got funding from the Wallenberg Foundation to compare Sweden using 200 sites with 50 sites in Madagascar, and we're using the malaise trap at 50 sites that are sampled every week, and every sample is sent for genomic analysis, and we get to know how many species were collected that week, and how at one site we can look at it change over time every week throughout the year, and we can compare that across. This was so successful, we started adding more tools. 
We added, anybody know what this is? This is called the Global Spore Sampler. We set this out, and every one of our stations, we sample the fungal spores in the air. Looks like air. But in this one trap, right there, that one trap, we collected 1,500 species of fungus, of fungal spores. Holy cow. They're almost all new species, but allowing us to actually tap into that. And now we're actually adding sound recordings where we can actually use, working with people like with, at NVIDIA, we can actually use AI to actually an analyze and identify the birds and even the chirping crickets that are recorded at each of those 50 sites. And we just received funding now to extend this for six years and add cam recorders that actually give us digital readouts of mammals, so far mostly poachers, but also mammals that come into the forest, and actually we can read that in real time. So we're creating a biodiversity tool in Madagascar that I hope one day can actually occur in California too. But it's interesting that we're doing it first in Madagascar and Sweden. But going back to Madagascar, this is what happens after forest leaves. This was a beautiful forest three years ago. Went back, and this is all that's left. The baobabs, which you think is a great tree, you're like, wow, how beautiful baobabs. It's the sacred tree that's hard to cut down with the machete, so it's left. But that's the only thing left. And it slowly dries out, and then the people live there, and there's nothing there. This is a story that's repeating in Madagascar because of immigration, Famine in the south is moving people north. They move into the remaining forest. The only thing they can do is slash and burn agriculture, cut down the forest. This is what they have. There's no other option. If your kids are hungry, there's no choice but to feed them. But this is just the tip of the iceberg. The world's population everywhere is increasing. In Madagascar, it'll double in 30 years. And this increasing population means you can't pit more cows on degraded landscapes, and soon there won't be any forest left. We want to save that remaining forest in places like Madagascar. And there's a link between, you could call it poverty, food insecurity, and the environment. And that was a hard thing for me to realize. If I wanted to save that 10% of the forest left in Madagascar, I had to deal with what's happening in the 90% outside the forest. So we created a program called Breakfast Before Conservation. We can't talk about preserving the forest if you don't have breakfast. And as an entomologist, I'm a bit surprised. It took me a long time to figure it out. It was right in front of me the whole time. And that is land shrimp. <laughs> Hopefully you had a chance to have some tonight. Land shrimp is everywhere. It's a traditional practice in Madagascar around the world. Entomophagy is called. Eating edible insects is a tradition, and it's slowly disappearing. But there are so many reasons, besides it tastes good, that one would want to eat insects. Now, insects have a small footprint. They have small feet, right? <laughs> They're going to have a small footprint. They have a small footprint because they're not warm-blooded. They're not warm-blooded, which means you don't have to waste food on heating their bodies. You don't have to waste food and water on cooling their bodies. All the food you give an insect converts to protein, converts to meat. So even if you didn't find new ways of giving chicken feed or corn to insects, compared to like cows, you would get six times more protein from feeding that same amount of food to a cricket than you would to a cow. Three times the amount of protein compared to a pig, and about two and a half times compared to a chicken. And you don't eat the feathers, you eat all the insects, even the legs. It all gets ground up, as you did tonight if you ate it, that was an entire insect. And also, this insect actually gives you more than just protein. Because it's an insect, it gives you more of the other micronutrients. In fact, if you had a steak, 
And if you compare that to eating an insect, your body could absorb more micronutrients like iron and other micronutrients because it's available to you, which is less available if you ate a steak. So there's many reasons, besides it tasting good, that you want to eat insects. And also, it improves your gut microbiome. Who cares about that? Well, if you're not feeling well and have are a sick child and are have um, been stunted or malnourished, you may have diarrhea, you may be sick. There's lots of reasons you may be malnourished. But if you eat edible insects, it improves your gut biome and you have less diarrhea and you can actually improve and gain, have gain, gain weight. So those are the reasons. But in Madagascar, nobody cares about those reasons. They're eating insects because it tastes good. That's why you ate it tonight. Now, we began this project by first going, Question one, what do people eat in Madagascar? So we surveyed across the entire country again. It was really fun. Back in the car, drive around the whole country, and seeing what people are eating. Here they are, often women, getting aquatic insects from the rice paddies in streams. Others are digging in the ground, eating not so yummy looking, huh, maybe? But look at this. This is a big catch. These are like, like a big as a mouse. These are crickets in the north of Madagascar that they're eating. We documented 110 species, and we recorded the recipes. We just published a, a work on one group that we've discovered. Um, but it was interesting to compare the recipes they use now with recipes that were documented like in the 1850s. They were exactly the same. They would gather up grasshoppers or locusts. They would take off their legs sometimes, or the wings rather, and fry them up and then eat them. And sometimes they didn't eat them. They would dry them, pound them into a powder, and then keep that powder, which is stable, and add it to their porridge throughout the rest of the year. So we figured, okay, this is what we want to focus on. We want to take the native tradition, augment it with some technology to make that available all year, and bring it to the villages to, one, provide food security, and two, improve the nutrients of health of the people, and three, impact biodiversity. For example, stop eating the lemurs. Instead, eat what? What other insects? So we wanted to actually go to where we thought bushmeat hunting was a real threat to extinction. So we went to the northeast of Madagascar where the people, 97% of them eat bushmeat. That means like lemurs and tenerex, where 36% of them eat the most endangered lemur in Madagascar. And we asked all the people there and surveyed them, had anthropologists involved, what's your favorite insect to eat? They said it was the bacon bug. <laughs> That's a bacon bug. It tastes like bacon. And we said, hmm, okay, let's see if we can farm this. So we went to the area called the Mashwal Peninsula. That's the green things to park. And we started working in villages around the entire park and trying to farm the bacon bug. Now, you wish I would have brought that, but since it didn't pair with wine very well, <laughs> I brought the cricket. There's the bacon bug. It naturally occurs in the environment there. The people, if they find it, they can sell it in the market because everybody loves it. And we started farming it, and it's working out great in all these villages. We've shown, we haven't published results yet, but we found a 50% reduction in the villages we're working in in terms of bushmeat consumption, in terms of lemur consumption, which means it's improving the chances that this lemur will survive. And those people who are rearing it and farming it are also able to sell it in the markets to improve their livelihoods, to get money for send children to school. It's working out fantastic. We're expanding this program throughout other areas in this region, but because it's a biological system, we can only work where this species is naturally found. So for every region of Madagascar, we have to go research what people want, what people like, and what insects will grow there. We wanted to start addressing, we think, where we see the most need, and that is in the famine-prone areas. In the south of Madagascar, this is the mother preparing her meal for her kids. That's it. Now, if there's any protein involved, the kids don't get it, the women don't get it, 
If by chance somebody brings in a piece of lemur, it goes to the elders in the community. The kids and children don't get it. What's the solution there? Now, we wanted to actually think about large-scale solutions. We wanted to find a solution that would allow us to feed like the 55,000 families that are experiencing famine or something that we could put in a village that has nothing. So we teamed up with Entomo Farms. This is Darren. Darren was the guy who called up and said, hey, you got 25,000 crickets a day? He has, his company switched from producing pet food to producing edible insects. This is the largest producer of cricket powder in North America, based in Canada. And they agreed to help us develop and apply this technology or processing this farming techniques they use in Canada to a species of choice in Madagascar. We had to find that species. So we have Darren on the right from Entomo Farms, and on the left is Sylvain. Sylvain is a cricket expert. And we began to explore and survey areas to find a cricket that we could farm and train staff and test and do research. In fact, this is the most pleasing research I've ever done. When I study ants and get something wrong, nobody finds out. I do, eventually. But here, when we did the research about a cricket, so we, for example, first off began testing nine species of crickets. Where would they lay their eggs? What temperature would they lay their eggs? What would they lay their eggs in? So we surveyed and found nine species. I wanted that big one. Remember that big one that looked like a rat? Oh. You put a bunch of them together and the males kill each other. The second biggest one, it laid its eggs in dirt only. Didn't like cotton balls. We finally found one that was great and tasty. That's what you ate tonight. And we had to figure out how to rear it. It wasn't the same protocol as Intimo Farms. We had to test it and develop it. How many days for the eggs? How many days for adults? And we finally figured out the system. So we have the system now for this species and we're trying to test other species and have an arsenal of species in case one fails us. And it's basically seven weeks to go from egg to food. This is the food. And it goes seven weeks. But actually, as you notice here, we get an equal amount of something else. Cricket fertilizer, cricket manure. And this is actually really interesting. This manure is fantastic. I didn't even think about it, cricket manure. But Entomo Farms said, hey, we're getting more money now for our cricket manure than we are from our cricket powder. And I said, what do you mean? He goes, yeah, the marijuana industry in Colorado <laughs> has figured out that cricket manure is the best fertilizer and they're buying it all. And I said, perfect. <laughs> we can actually use this for a holistic solution to improve degraded landscapes in Madagascar. Bring these landscapes back. Green them as we develop a food solution to these people. But I'm getting ahead of the story. Nobody's ever farmed edible insects. We had to create or teach the government of Madagascar that this is a good thing and get it processed. In fact, our company's the, we had to create kind of a, a name, a brand, Valala Farms. Valala is basically cricket in Malagasy. There's the Queen Palace right here. The Queen last in the, in, the, in the capital had two chefs that specialized in crickets. So we thought that would be good to remind people we're not inventing something here. This is something you've always ate. And so we had to get it approved. In fact, we're the first one to get approved for human consumption in Madagascar. And then we went global and got it globally certified as a uh, uh, sustainable product. And we had to build our farm. And here's one of our workers. We have about 28 staff that work on our farming across uh, the program in Madagascar. And we currently, you could say we're at the pilot level. We have three uh, kind of clients that buy our product. We have uh, the school lunch programs in the capital. We have tuberculosis clinics. In fact, this is an interesting story. So we didn't go look for tuberculosis clinics to buy our product, but they came to us and said, we want to just want to test this. So they gave half the people, three days a week, lunch with cricket powder. And they begin to gain more weight, and they begin to get better. And then the other half said, hey, we want in on this. And they demanded, they had a revolt. The experiment's over. Everybody gets their cricket powder three days a week. And then they said, wait a minute, we want it every day of the week. In fact, they refused to eat if there wasn't cricket powder in their food. Because everybody was getting better. Because if you're healthy, 
you respond better to the treatment. And only those that were getting cricket powder were getting better. So now they expanded to all the TB clinics in Madagascar. Well, that's what they came to us, but we didn't have enough product. And then we had the famine relief program in the South. They wanted us to feed 55,000 families. That's about two tons a month, but we didn't have enough. So we created this incredible demand that only could meet about 10% of the product. Now, you saw the product over there as a powder, and that powder is amazing because you can ship it, it's stable, it doesn't rot, you don't need refrigeration, and you can add it to almost anything. In Madagascar, they add it to a porridge for breakfast, or they add it to a sauce that's added to the rice in the evening. It's wonderful. Now, you may be saying, well, I don't, I'm a vegetarian, but I just want to say that we we've treat these animals uh, respectfully in a sense that we harvest them just before they die. We plan our harvest two days before they would normally die. And that's the beauty of farming insects. You don't kill them when they're a juvenile, like a chicken or, or a cow. You're actually waiting for the laid eggs, and it's end of life. And how we do it in Madagascar, we harvest them. This is a bucket. We add some CO2, and they just go to sleep. And then we actually uh, wash them, we grind them, we stick them in an oven for drying, and then it's the powder, that powder that you just ate over there. This powder, can, you can do anything with it. In fact, there are four top chefs in Madagascar, here's one down here, they are actually developing recipes that build on the traditions in Madagascar, and we're producing a cookbook now that is a fabulous way to actually use the cricket powder. And once this, cook this cookbook is out, I'll make sure it's available here so that you can do it. But we still have this problem. We've created this incredible need. We've shown it's wonderful, but we can only produce a certain amount because we spent the last two days refining and developing the technique. So now we're in the process of, this is our biodiversity center in Madagascar in that giant big square. I was just in Madagascar three weeks ago and shaking with the minister's hand, the given that they have just donated this land and building that will allow us to have 30,000 square feet to grow our first large-scale cricket farm in Madagascar. That will give us about 620,000 meals a year. Now, this is actually when we can start fulfilling about 40% of the orders we have now. And so this is still the beginning. But back to that fertilizer. We have a small test pilot project in the back of uh, in our center where we have vegetables that people can use the cricket powder for their vegetable gardens. You can see the great difference. Left has the cricket fertilizer, the right doesn't. But imagine going into the landscapes where the people actually live. Three weeks ago, I was also here taking this picture in an area where the immigrants have come and they've killed, they just all the forest down. These people have nothing anymore. Either they're going to move to the next forest or they're going to be given an alternative. And I'm suggesting all alternative will be crickets, cricket farming. Cricket farming combined with restoration. And we're working with Missouri Botanical Garden and another group to actually demonstrate that this cricket fertilizer is like the magic sauce to make reforestation work in a country like Madagascar where the landscape is dead unless you do some magic. And it's working. So this is the first time we've actually had kind of restoration working. And it's thanks, in a sense, to cricket poop. So for Madagascar, we want to actually couple these kind of larger farms with these community works where the larger farms are sold the product to like family relief efforts. And that funnels the money to these village projects that require constant input. So it's a sus financially sustainable model that allows conservation and biodiversity to happen, but also we address social issues in the country. Sounds good for Madagascar, right? But will you, on your next house party, <laughs> be having hors d'oeuvres with crickets? Some vanilla sautéed whole crickets? Are you willing to make the, the big jump from sea cricket to land shrimp? Now, we may think this is a great solution for Madagascar, and it is, and from Africa, because it will grow and be expanded to Africa. 
But what about us? We're pretty safe here, right? But maybe not, right? Maybe this PG and E thing makes us start thinking things are be different. We can keep buying time, buffering us. We'll buy a generator for sure. Everybody's got to have a generator now. And we may think, well, there's always planet B, right? <laughs> we all love Elon Musk, right, Delta? He's going to take us to Mars, right? But if you, if you read the book Martian, right, what are you going to eat in, on Mars? Potatoes, right? You can't live off potatoes. What are they going to farm? The most sustainable protein source possible, and that'll be crickets. So don't wait for planet B. This is our wonderful community, which I'm so happy to be part of, and it's a solution that we can bring home. Maybe we have some time. People in Madagascar don't have time. In Madagascar, if they can't just go buy a generator to buy themselves time, they have to move. They have to feed their kids. They have now to solve the problem. We have some time. The solution may not happen for us, but we have to be willing. We have to be brave enough to say it's a solution we have to embrace because we don't have planet B as an option. So go home tonight and think about our home here, our lovely community, and think about crickets. Thank you.